Well, welcome to the second of these two talks. In the first talk, we met Anna Frank, who was writing her diary from her hiding place in Amsterdam between June 1942 and July 1944. Well, in this talk, we're going to meet Etty Hillesum. And Etty was writing her diary, also in Amsterdam, indeed only a mile and a half down the road from Anna Frank's house. And she was writing between March 1941 and October 1942. Or at least that's what of her diary has survived. The last notebook that she wrote in was lost. And we have some letters of hers that helped to fill in that gap until her death in nine, November 1943. And in looking at Etty for this talk, I want to focus on two themes. The first one is the linking theme I'm using for both Anna and Etty, which is the idea of finding a broad hall between narrow walls. And the other theme I want to use is the theme of obedience. Well, that might seem like a rather unlikely pairing but let's see how we go. So let's begin with the theme I started uh, the first talk with, that quote from Welsh poet Waldo Williams, the opening words, what is living? Broad hall found between narrow walls. Well, I find this a very attractive idea that you can find freedom and spaciousness in situations of limitation and restriction. But what has to happen for it to happen? Can it just happen? Or do we have to do something? Some recent research in the UK showed that a majority of people surveyed hoped that the world would be a better place after COVID-19. They could see good things happening and emerging and were optimistic about them continuing. Yet at the same time, most people wanted things to go back to normal as soon as possible. So maybe change would be desirable but if that means I have to be one of the ones who changes, maybe I'm not so sure about that. Perhaps we instinctively know that the sort of personal change which makes a real difference is not so easily won. We do have to do something, undergo something. But what? And what if we have to call upon the unpopular, even threatening Christian virtue of obedience? I wonder if you listened to Sarah Bachelard's marvelous series of talks under the title, A Living Hope, The Shape of Christian Virtue. If you did, you might remember her talking about obedience as really the virtue of virtues in Christian thought. And as she began to talk about it, I found myself thinking of Etty Hillesum and that her life, what we find in her diaries, might be a very good way to see how this sort of obedience works out in a life not so very remote from our own. Well, who was Etty? Etty was a Dutch Jew, a secular Jew, born in 1914, murdered in Auschwitz in 1943 at the age of 29. In the last 18 months of her life, she wrote a diary, which was eventually published along with her letters from the period. 
during this time, as I said earlier, she was living in Amsterdam. And maybe you don't need reminding of the sort of restrictions she was subject to as a Jew in a Nazi regime. There were increasing lim limitations on what Jews could buy, where they could go, how they could earn a living, who they could meet with, how they could move about. And in Etty's case, along with thousands of others, it meant removal to a transit camp just outside the city and eventually transport from there to the death camps. How is it possible even to begin to think about notions like freedom and spaciousness amid all of that? It seems a ridiculous idea. And what could obedience have to do with it? Even more ridiculous. And it is ridiculous if obedience only means to bow to external authority in fear and trembling. Exactly the terror that was going on in Amsterdam. But what if we start with Father Lawrence's understanding of obedience? He puts it like this. Obedience is not doing what you're told, but becoming the word you hear. I'll say that again. Obedience is not doing what you're told, but becoming the word you hear. And that draws us back to the root meaning of the word obedience from the Latin verb meaning to listen. It reminds me of the story of the transfiguration. Out of the cloud on the mountain top is heard the voice. This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. And the hearers are stunned into silence. What they hear is a revelation and an invitation. There is something utterly extraordinary going on here. And yet it is a simple invitation to enter into this beautiful relationship between father and son. The listening called forth from them and for us is a transformative listening from the heart, from the depths of our being, in which there is only love, a love which has no place for fear, which takes us way beyond words and reveals who we really are. Well, we don't all have revelations of that sort on mountaintops. But we do all have some sort of awakening. Etty's first awakening was a listening into herself, which painfully revealed long suppressed truths about herself. Outwardly young, vibrant, intense, passionate, educated, cultured, independent, a lover, a teacher, a writer. She suddenly confronted with a stark and only just bearable sense of shame and fear. She puts it like this. I seem to be a match for most of life's problems. And yet deep down, something like a tightly wound ball of twine binds me relentlessly. And at times I am nothing more or less than a miserable, frightened creature. It's hard indeed to hear that in yourself and not reject it. It takes courage not to recoil from, as she puts it, a slice of chaos staring at me from deep down inside my soul. Courage not to hear that and snatch back control again. 
18 months later, she sums up her life in these terms. Truly, my life is one long listening into myself and into others, into God. And if I say that I listen, it is really God who listens inside me. The most essential and deepest in me, listening into the most essential and deepest in the other. God to God. At his diaries reveal a continuing struggle going on in her. But the struggle becomes less and less a struggle to keep everything under control. And more and more a struggle to be obedient to what is growing in her from deep within. And that's a very different matter. Etty finds that an inner impulse can push its way through at any moment, quite unexpected. Here's one of them. I suddenly went down on my knees, almost automatically, forced to the ground by something stronger than myself. The language of force and something stronger than myself could ring alarm bells. Except that in the next sentence, she describes this force as creative and the act of kneeling as an intimate gesture of love. Kneeling seemed alien and embarrassing to her at first, but it quickly becomes a treasured activity which gives physical expression to an urgent need and desire she had been quite unaware of previously. She writes, a desire to kneel as though my body had been made for the act of kneeling. To respond to a gifted impulse is one thing. To be obedient to the invitation it brings to learn to listen into, to God as a way of life requires freely undertaken discipline. Etty realizes that she has to learn to practice prayer, including meditation. I'll turn inward for half an hour each morning before work and listen to my inner voice, lose myself. You could call it meditation. She also has to listen to her teacher, listen into the Bible, and to writers who speak profoundly of God, and write her diary. And as the diaries proceed, we see the reality of God unfold for her as a fruit of this sort of obedience. God, she discovers in her experience and understanding, is love, joy, peace, beautiful, rich, intimate, mystery, silence, simplicity, faithful. All around her, hatred, ugliness, violence, inhumanity, betrayal, fear and desperation seem to be stamping out the good. And yet as he comes to see that the ultimate truths of God are exactly that, ultimate. Nothing can destroy them. They always endure and are utterly trustworthy. Even when so hidden, it takes a very clear and penetrating eye to see them. She writes, The misery here is quite terrible. And yet, late at night, when the day has slunk away into the depths behind me, I often walk with a spring in my step along the barbed wire. And then time and again, it soars straight from my heart. I can't help it. That's just the way it is, like some elementary force. The feeling that life is glorious and magnificent. 
At other times, it takes a great deal of determination to marshal thoughts which have spun off down dark, chaotic, destructive alleyways. But, he end, but in the end, she comes back to things like this. I shall always feel safe in God's arms. They may well succeed in breaking me physically, but no more than that. I may face cruelty and deprivation, the like of which I cannot imagine. Yet all this is as nothing to the immeasurable expanse of my faith in God and my inner receptiveness. Well, who are you listening into? Who are you hearing? Who are you obeying? When you listen into, when you hear, when you obey God. On the one hand, Etty thinks of a deep well inside herself in which God dwells. Sometimes she is there too, but often there is a blockage of stones and grit which has to be cleared away. Yet that God she hears is also her own voice. Quote, and that probably expresses my own love of life. I repose in myself. And that part of myself, that deepest and richest part in which I repose, is what I call God. What first seemed to be a force outside herself now seems to have become herself. It is a reoriented self, reoriented from a depth within herself she didn't know she possessed, from a blessed silence growing within, from an inner spaciousness she could never have dreamed of, from a receptiveness to love which is beyond any human love she has experienced. Recall Father Lawrence's words. Obedience is not doing what you are told, but becoming the word you hear. So when you are obedient, are you obedient to God or to yourself? Are you doing what someone else wants or what you want? The distinction between yourself as subject and God as object simply breaks down. The word you are hearing is changing you and you cannot help being true to your transformed self. Early in the diaries, Etty says, something in me is growing. And every time I look inside, something fresh has appeared. And all I have to do is accept it, to take it upon myself, to bear it forward and to let it flourish. That's the dynamic of obedience which begins to work in us as we commit ourselves to meditation. Etty again. He enclosed a quotation, and yet God is love. I completely agree, and it is truer now than ever. This growing conviction is what gives Etty's life meaning and purpose in this landscape of appalling suffering and destruction. A meaning and direction she had despaired of ever finding before. Once you learn to listen into God, you can't help listening into yourself and to others. You simply become a person who listens and hears. If you are truly hearing God, you are hearing love, whose nature is to reverberate in you and through you 
to others. For Etty, it works out like this. Something else about this morning, the perception very strongly born in that despite all the suffering and injustice, I cannot hate others. Sometimes that is nearly impossible for Etty to do. It takes all her strength and resolve when she's faced with the brutality of soldiers and the misery of innocent people. At other times, love wells up in her spontaneously. Increasingly, it becomes an abiding disposition. She writes, I keep discovering that there is no causal connection between people's behavior and the love you feel for them. Love for one's fellow man is like an elemental glow that sustains you. Mainly, she discovers, it has to be lived hour by hour, wherever she finds herself. As she puts it, all the strength and love and faith in God that one possesses must be there for everyone who chances to cross one's path and who needs it. In the last phase of her life, Etty goes to work in the dreaded transit camp caring for those incarcerated there. She can see that what God has grown in her is what is needed there in the camp. And so the camp is where she must be. A compassion has grown in her, which compels her to share the destiny of her people, rendering her strong enough to be with them in their suffering. She also carries the precious gift of being able to listen in and read people. How great are the needs of your creatures on this earth, O oh God? They sit there talking quietly and quite unsuspecting and suddenly their need erupts in all its nakedness. Then there they are, bundles of human misery, desperate and unable to face life. And that's when my task begins. It is not enough to proclaim you, God, to commend you to the hearts of others. One must clear the path towards you in them, God. And to do that, one has to be a keen judge of the human soul. I embark on a slow voyage of exploration with everyone who comes to me. And I thank you for the gift of being able to read people. And I promise you, yes, I promise, that I shall try to find a dwelling and a refuge for you in as many houses as possible. There are so many empty houses and I shall prepare them all for you, the most honored lodger. Well, let's return to the beginning in order to end. What is living? Broad hall found between narrow walls. What Etty discovered was that privation and suffering forced her to dig down to the few things that really matter in life and focus on them. We'll end with her words. People here fritter their energy away on the thousand irksome details that grind us down every day. That's why they get driven off course and find existence pointless. The few big things that matter in life are what we have to keep in mind. The rest can be quietly abandoned. 
And you can find those few big things anywhere. You have to keep rediscovering them in yourself so that you can be renewed. And in spite of everything, you always end up with the same conviction. Life is good after all. It's not God's fault things go awry sometimes. The cause lies in ourselves. And that's what stays with me, even now. Even when I'm about to be packed off to Poland. <laughs>